Guys, welcome back to the Mastery Podcast. I am delighted to be joined by a gentleman that I was introduced to six years ago now. Um, and we had the pleasure of actually meeting in person in London. Uh, I'm sure in a second we'll, we'll delve into that. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to have Eugene Teo on the podcast from, uh, you're in Australia now, right, Eugene? Yeah, still in Australia. Amazing. Love that. Well, listen, guys, you know, um, I commit to bringing on expert coaches that have not only great coaches that have gone on to make a huge impact around the world with coaches and education and basically taking the thing that is their skill set and their genius and turning into a successful business that's helped a lot of people around the world. And Eugene, you know, um, you are the founder of the Gamble Method. um, And I know that is a very successful digital platform that's help, helping educate coaches. But for coaches don't know who don't know you around the world right now, could you just give us a, a little summary of who you are and, and kind of what it is that you focus on today? And then we'll pack into your story. Yeah. Um, so thank you for the warm welcome. It's a really big pleasure to be on here and, you know, do something like this after yeah, we, we met up so long ago when I was, you know, you welcome me into your gym to be able to run one of my events. And, and that's yeah. where um, a lot of people would potentially know me from is um, I'm a trainer by trade and I worked in person for several years and then I started doing a lot of educational workshops, traveling around, teaching trainers about biomechanics, all that kind of stuff. Um, and more so today, I, I leverage the online space to be able to um, reach more people, which I think is something that everybody should be doing to a degree um, just because it is such easy ways to be able to connect with other people and have a um a bigger impact so yes i do have this um this app i've been developing for the last five years i want to say yeah five years now um called the gambaru method and that's a platform where i share um mainly training programs guidance for people and also a little bit of the education on the side whereas a few years ago it was purely education education as a platform but now because of just the market it's pivoted more to be able to provide detailed solutions for people to say here is where you can come to train to just have it all done for you um and just reach more people i love that yeah well i remember sitting in notting hill gate um having a coffee and having a conversation with you and unfortunately i couldn't be with you but the you know the feedback from the, the day with the guys in Nottingham was was amazing and uh you know i remember you were saying to me you were traveling a lot then like you were traveling around a lot and doing in-person events. Um, obviously, a lot, a lot has changed since then. But what, one of the things that's really important to me with the coaches listening to this episode is this gap, right? Because they see you, they see other coaches that I interview, and they see this is where they are, and there's little old me, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not where I want to be. But just to give us some perspective, you know, how did your coaching start, and how did you find, how did you find the love of coaching? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I. Like I first started like fresh out of high school. Like I was, my first real job was just working as a PT in a gym. And the reason I did that was because in high school, I just loved going to the gym and training. And I didn't even realize it was kind of a job that you could do. Um, and that was it. It was like, this is my place. And it's always been the place that I've just always thrived in because like growing up, I was never good at sports. I was never really athletic in that sense. But for me, I think for a lot of people, um, either you're awesome at sports, this is why you love the gym, or you suck at sports. But you find the gym because it's the one thing that just about anybody can access and see improvements in. So that's that's what it was for me. And I started getting a lot of um, just reward for, from doing that. And then I've just always been someone who's just very fascinated by trying to find answers and, and better ways um, to just get the results that I want out of myself and those around me. And it would just excite me to be working with people, who, whoever they were. Like it was never my aspiration to be working with coaches or work with athletes. It was just like, I want to work with the person in front of me, whoever comes to me and is willing to give me a 12 pack up front for PT. I was like, this is awesome. I want to make sure I'm giving you something fantastic and um, doing whatever I can to deliver on those promises. Um, I think one thing that helped me out a lot was um I would never back down from the idea that I didn't know something, which is also a negative, you know? <laughs> so I'd be like, hey, you know, I'm vegan. You ever worked with vegans before? Like, yes, I have. I most certainly, <laughs> yes, I, obviously I had not at the time. Yeah, same, um, yeah. but it was just a sort of thing where I was like, you know what? I'll work it out. I'll figure it out. How hard can it really be? And a lot of the time that bit me in the ass, but a lot of the time it would get me excited to be like, okay, I've got to work it. How am I going to not appear as a fraud to this vegan? And, and give them steak on their diet by accident how do i make it interesting and engaging for them and actually informative how can i help them with 
my skill set, not as a coach, but as somebody who can synthesize the information that they need and give it to them in that in that format that they want it in. Um, did, you find, did you find it hard? Uh, those early stages, I never really want to do an episode of my podcast without without reflecting on those early days, because it's funny you say that, because if somebody came into me and said, oh, I had a med- you know, uh, a cruciate uh, injury or I had an Achilles injury a while ago or I hurt my lower back, I'm like, yep, get it completely. And then I go home and I sit with the books and I go, holy crap, like I need to learn this stuff now. Uh, or I'd re- I reach out to a physio, a friend of mine, and like I was... I was I was obsessed with give me something that I don't know because it gave me an opportunity to get into books and study it. Um, but you know that I mean it was terrifying because the amount of people that kept coming to me that I had no idea what to do with them. But back in those early days of coaching people, did you have the confidence in the early days, or was it just to give some kind of context to people? Was it simply scrambling for Christ? I don't know what I'm doing. Um, it was a bit of both. So I mean, one thing was you know I, w- I was 18. So, of course, when you're 18, you think you can do fucking anything. You think you're the king. You're like, fuck, yeah, I, I healed that person. <laughs> it's like, no, no, you taught them how to squat. I'm like, I cured that patient. <laughs> like, no, you didn't. You're not a doctor. But there was a bit of that 18-year-old bravado, which yeah. very quickly got cut down by some of the other trainers in the gym who were much older and more mature. They were like, you don't know fucking shit, kid. And that was, you know, a big wake-up call. But there definitely was a huge part of that was I would panic. Because I'd be like, I've just told this person I can help them about with this injury or with this pain or with whatever it is. How can I provide the best solution for them? Um, and I need to do my research. I need to find the right people to go to. I need to ask the right questions and um, hopefully find an answer that works for them. But I'll also be, you know, I was do my best to not be deceptive about it with people. I wouldn't say, yes, I can cure this. <laughs> I would say, look, I'm going to do my absolute best. And it's something that that makes a lot of sense logically to me. And here's what I think we should do um use my best approximation for it and i'd always add in those little buffers when it came to explaining my processes to people and that gave me confidence because i'll tell them like i'm not a physio i'm not a doctor i haven't studied biomechanics formally so of course i'm going to get shit wrong and that's completely fine if i do because for me that's part of the learning experience and they're coming to me as a client or as a student because one thing, they kind of respect the knowledge that I might put out there, but they more so really care about the experience that I'm giving them and the way that I can synthesize and pass things onto them in a simplified format, um, for better or worse. And they understand that. They're not coming to me for a university lecture, which is perfect because I, I can't give that. Yeah. Were you, um, would you class yourself as, I mean, you know, you know a lot. Um, did you come into the industry pretty intelligent or did you come in, you know, were you, were you good at school? You know, a lot of coaches we talk to kind of end up being a PT because they don't really think that they did very well. Were you, were you, were you pretty smart at school? Um, if I applied myself to it, yes. So like up until the final year of school, I was like close to getting expelled kind of thing. And I was just skipping class and getting into trouble all the time. But when I knew the final year is the one that actually matters, because that's what then dictates what college you can go to, all your different scores and whatnot. Okay. I just did a complete 180 and just became front of the class, front and center, doing all my notes in advance. And, you know, I was top of the state in several subjects and top of my school in several subjects from that, just that one year of application. Mm. Um, and, th- and then I lost it when I found uni um, and, and found like that, that, that there was no structure and you just had to <laughs> fend for yourself. Um, but in saying that, I am somebody who, if I apply myself to it because I am I can see the payoff or because I'm excited by it, I'll nerd out harder than anybody. You, you clearly, when you join the, the beginning of the industry, you, you know, I think some coaches take five, six, sometimes 10 years and they just, they don't really, you don't really see much urgency to improve. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so it's like, you know, oh, I haven't really put my prices up. It's six years down the line. I've not really done anything or my clients aren't achieving any level of results. But early on in the, your career, you obviously started going, okay, I want to learn this. I want to learn that. What do you think your driver was in those early days? Because I, I, I'll, I'll tell you for me, um, my, I, I figured this out later on in my career, but I didn't feel very significant when I was younger. Mm. I want it, I, and then when I got into the fitness industry, I like this whole idea of everybody saying, "I want to work with you. Um, I'm going to pay you money. Uh, um, I think you're knowledgeable about what you're doing." And I was like, "Oh, I like this, right?" And you kind of alluded that, like, you're help, helping people was something that was giving me this significance. And then I just wanted more and more and more. Firstly, what is it that what gave you in coaching that 
like hunger to just keep learning more? And why do you think it is that coaches can't struggle to find that? So two parts there. So yeah, what got me, like what drove me, I guess, to what, keep what's your, pushing. What's your, what was your driver in the first few years? Because I watched some um, trainers in the gym. They just, mm. they just literally go relentless with their study and they go, Poof, and they become great. And then some just stand still. So what was it? What do you, what do you feel unpacked your drive? It was, for me, it was bodybuilding and it was insecurity of um, not being enough, similar to you, but the physical yeah. side of it, where I was like, hey, I, I want to build myself, I want to look like that guy. I want to, um, I want to just look the part of this big physical dominant person. Um, I want to, I want that. Um, so I was just trying to work out how can I do that for myself? And that's what was pushing me more and more to learn all those sciences of that of training and biochemistry and nutrition and whatnot and then applying it to the people that i'd that i would work with um and i'll tell you nothing like you have two different forces in life you've got like the push or you have have the pull um in terms of something is either pushing you to do something or something's actually drawing you in and it's much easier to just be drawn in let your insecurities pull you along than this to say you know what i want to make a lot of money and live in dubai and all that kind of stuff. I've got to push myself to reach that carrot on the end of the stick. But if you can find a way to tap into something visceral and deep that will pull you, then even on your laziest days when you're demotivated, it's still there ticking in the back of your mind. Even if you know what, like this is probably going to be chopped up and sound really unhealthy uh, as a TikTok or something, but there is a little bit of health within that or if you can recognize it. Like for me, like insecurity, it's not a healthy mental state. But I knew how to channel that insecurity in a way that would help pull me through hours of study and research and training and putting myself through unhealthy practices that eventually drove me as a coach to become a better coach and to seek out those people. Like it's not normal to like as a coach or as a as a client, like I remember if I had the opportunity from people who I looked up to to go train with them or to see them or to travel, I'd be like, I'll drop everything, I will spend all my money, I'll put myself broke, I'll stay up all night to drive out to go see you to be able to spend time to spend one hour with with somebody you know to to learn from them and that's not necessarily a healthy behavior you know <laughs> it's it's a very uh, it's a very wasteful one in some way but I was like no I want to do that because I know this person's got the answer that I need to help solve my insecurity problems of whatever it was I was trying to achieve and that's pulling me through but if it was for the the push of yeah I'll be successful then yeah it's it's not as motivating you think therefore i mean it's really interesting because i really lent into my insecurities, um, yeah. eight years of bodybuilding and building my physique to be the biggest it could be for myself was, yeah. was purely born. I always say this and I've said this so many times, but, uh, you know, uh, one of the greatest sayings that I heard is that your body is either a shield of armor or a completion of your character. And for many years, my body was a shield of armor. I was just so insecure and I was just literally lats out, chest up, yeah. walking around. Um, but it drove me and that physique got me to where, a huge direction in the fitness industry. So what were the what were the main insecurities that you led lent into? And and just to give some perspective to coaches so that they kind of, you know, I, I think this is an important no one's really touched on this on, on any episodes really with me, that, you know, we're trying to get rid of all these insecurities sometimes. Whereas they mm. could be, they could be and can be some of the things that we almost need to work through and lean into to get us to where we need to be. So what were, what were some of the biggest insecurities you were dealing with to give some relatability to coaches? Um, for me, it was a lot of confidence in myself, you know, like for one thing, physically, I didn't have a lot of confidence in my own physique because um, same as you bodybuilding, that was my, my thing. That was, I was obsessed with getting bigger, looking, winning the next title, being the biggest guy in the gym, um, which I, I never was, but, <laughs> but that was always the goal. Um, yeah. And just gain, like, I just felt like the bodybuilders I looked up to, not like the Jay Cutlers or anything, but there's people in the gyms that I looked up to, they look like they just got, they, they got it going on. You know, they got the, they got the girls, they got the popularity, they just got the confidence. I wanted that because for me, like growing up, um, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. I didn't have a lot of self-worth. And I felt like, again, if I had the body, people would respect me or they would at least like, yeah, they would feel like they had this because I had something they didn't have or they looked impressive in that way that would give me something to talk about or even if i couldn't talk it didn't matter because i was just jacked and shredded yeah so that was kind of like my my facade and and why i pushed so hard into that did you did you shed that at any point was there a significant moment in your career where you went wow this insecure low in self-worth low in self-confidence person almost feels like you don't need the physique anymore um and yeah. that, that was that was a shield was there a significant moment where you kind of went 
wow, I, I don't know if I need to be as big as I thought I needed to be. Totally. It was the last time I did my bodybuilding show. Um, like I didn't win that. So, so I know that I could have gotten bigger and I could have still gotten better as well. But I just had reached this turning point of saying like, am I really enjoying this for one thing? Um, like I said, I have a really good hard look at myself. Like, do I really enjoy the life that I'm living? I feel like I'm angry all the time. And it wasn't the trend. It was just my, my personality of just like, this isn't something I'm really enjoying. And as I started to sort of pivot away from that, I was just pivoting more into my business as well. And over that next couple of years or so, I, you know, I, I sized down a little bit. And then I realized more and more, oh, people don't care. Nobody cares whether I'm 80 kilos shredded or if I'm 70 kilos and not as shredded. They don't care that much. Like they care more about the substance of my character. They care more about the experience I deliver. They care more about the content that I create. And you know, as you know, with content creation or Instagram, you can make yourself look jacked. Anyway, who gives a fuck? You know, with the, with the right lighting and angles, you can make yourself look good. Um, and people don't care. And I was like, oh, they don't care. Why do I care that much? Because I, as I put a lot of value into their opinions, I thought, why do I care? So I, mean, I actually don't. Actually, what, I said to myself, what do I really enjoy doing? I enjoy teaching. I enjoy traveling at the time. I enjoy doing a lot of things that I was doing. I said, N the physique doesn't necessarily, isn't a prerequisite for any of that. Looking this certain way, living this bodybuilding lifestyle isn't a prerequisite to do those things. Um, if I'd enjoyed that bodybuilding lifestyle, then for sure, I would absolutely keep doing it. But I wasn't enjoying it. Um, it was at a point where it was negatively affecting my relationships, it was negatively affecting my ability to enjoy traveling because, you know, I'd be flying around to different locations thinking, I've got to prep my meals. I've got to make sure I have my food ready. And I wasn't thinking about enjoying myself and living it up for what it was or meeting new people and being able to go out and just enjoy those experiences. Um, so it was like a few years around this year, 2015-ish era when I stopped competing and started leaning more into my business and um, impacting people in a more positive way through that. And I was like, this is actually what I enjoy a lot more. And if we're really going to look at it from the insecurity thing that drove me from day one, I really wanted that feeling of importance. Everybody does. They want that feeling of significance. And I was like, I can get it from looking a certain way. But hey, if I'm getting it from people coming to my events and listening to what I say and me being able to give them a great experience with education, is the physique so important? I'm getting the exact same outcome of the soul, of the respect and the enjoyment, fulfillment from it. So the physique just stopped being a thing. And I think therefore what it sounds like is that you lent into something that was bigger um, and you started asking yourself quality questions. What do I want? And I think a lot of people are led very much by what they see without asking themselves what they want. You know, Absolutely. I, 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 you know, I believe the industry expects this and it's not okay to be who I want to be. I just almost have to create this false, false side of, of me. Um, I'm, I'm, I really want to delve into your coaching, right? Because, um, your education and look, your social media is viewed by thousands every single day, tens of thousands every single day. Um, I want to get into the social media side, the content side and, and all that late, later on, but, I'm always fascinated by people's ability to articulate their uniqueness and what makes them different. Some of your approach to training and building muscle that you so well articulate on your page and what do you feel positions you differently in terms of your beliefs around training? Um, I would say it, it's kind of come full full circle in a way where um, I, I, I can say that I know enough about how to do things as optimally and as perfect as possible for say powerlifting or for bodybuilding or whatever it is. I know, I know how to the exact formula that scientifically makes the most sense, but I also, but what comes with that knowledge is knowing that knowing how to break all those rules and also how to apply it to the person in front of you, which I think is most important. And also understanding that, Hey, just because something may not be the most 10 out of 10 optimal doesn't mean that it's completely useless. You know, and doesn't and doesn't mean that it can't serve a lot of purposes. And that then opens up a lot of doors to be able to explore just other interests. Um, in terms of like from the pure physical aspect. Like I love training gym. I just like you would grow up bodybuilding, but I really love gymnastics. I love calisthenics training. I love um I love the ideas of Olympic weightlifting. I love CrossFit. I love looking at all these different kinds of training, saying, Okay, I want to do these things for myself. One thing, how can I justify it? <laughs> but also what are the other potential benefits to doing these kinds of things? And how is it that you know, some of the most thickly, densely muscled erectors I've ever seen haven't been on bodybuilders, but they've been on weightlifters. Um, and it makes a fair bit of sense. You can sort of understand that. But what about the upper back thickness, the traps? What about 
the best arms or shoulders usually being on gymnasts um, or even like the best mobility being on different, different styles of athletes. Okay, what are they doing? And yeah, it's not optimal to build muscle if we're looking at it through an isolated straw, but what if we're looking at this from the organism of a human and saying, we're not going to be athletes for the rest of our lives. Even if I was Mr. Olympia, I know I'm not going to be, there's a shelf life on that. I'm not going to be Mr. Olympia for the rest of my life. I'm going to do that for a period, but I also want to make sure that when I exit it, I can exit it and have other things to do. And my body is capable of carrying me through whatever I want to throw throw that way. And that's where I think um, a lot of the whole optimal ideas of training um, always respect it, but also know how to push away from it and say, what what could be done better or differently? And maybe the suboptimal way is actually the best way if you take a wider outlook on it. Like, I know, um, I used to even, even myself, I would bag on chin-ups a lot saying, you know, it's unstable, compare it to a stable hammer strength or Nautilus, explode, pull down, it's a chin-up is shit for your lats. But then you realize, well, why is it shit in this theory? Because it's unstable, which means the body has to control a lot more variables around the shoulder joint. I said, okay, that's, that's fair. But what if you got so good at chin-ups in the unstable environment? What happens when you go to a stable environment? You're probably going to get a shit ton out of it, even more than had you not have done the chin-ups in the first place. Um, now, we have finite resources to be able to devote to everything, but why not do a little bit of both? Or why not periodize phases of both based on what you enjoy as well? And what are you going to get from the chin-up that you can't get from the Nautilus pull-down? There's a plethora of different things you can get and can't get. So it's about being a lot more um, open-minded and free to just sort of adapt to... Um, to what you want to do with training and with that then which i think is going to open up such an amazing conversation we look at the coaching we look at coaching and you know coaches kind of fall into the biomechanics realm or specializing mm. more in the nutritional realm um we don't see as many coaches you know really delving into the mobility and movement that cross over to the strength they kind of everybody tends to segment in certain areas but then we have mm. this shelf life of a client yeah. So the clients, the clients learned the biomechanics of leg extension, leg curl, and they've managed to do their 12 week transformation. And I see a lot of coaches that struggle with retention. Mm. I see a lot of coaches that struggle with understanding the concept of progression in multiple forms. Is the idea therefore that potentially a coach needs to be a little bit more rounded in their approach to working with a human being from the methodology that you share? Absolutely. Like I, I would say without a doubt, that is one of the most important things as a coach that you could be is not be niched into bodybuilding or powerlifting or having this one skill set in biomechanics. Um, because, unless if you work specifically with, with Mr. Olympias or you work specifically just with powerlifters and then you know that these clients you're going to get, they're here just for that. And once they're out, they're out <laughs> or they're with you till till death, till they, they die a powerlifter or whatever. Um, I think if you're working like 99% of coaches are in the industry of the gen pop, you need to be a generalist. Yes. And I think that's, you know, I'm very grateful for my time working in commercial gyms, which, you know, given the day and age now of trainers where you can just enter the online space and be a specialist coach in a certain thing immediately, um, where you can just sort of leapfrog the idea of having to work in a more commercial setting, people don't get that. But it forces you to become a generalist to say like, you know, when I was a PT 2009, I was heavy bodybuilding. But I learned very quickly that it doesn't work with clients because they don't want hardcore bodybuilding. They want a little bit of it. But at the end of the day, just like you said, after the topic transformation, we're doing their extreme dieting and their German body comp training and whatever else you might throw at them. It's like, well, well, where's the fun? Where's they want to do CrossFit because is it is a community? They want to try that really explosive plyometric stuff. They want to do some cardio because it makes them feel good. You know, they want to play a sport. Oh, hang on. Hold the fucking phone. You can't play rugby on the weekends. That's suboptimal for your games because you got leg day on Monday. It's like, like it's it doesn't fit. And it should, we should be as coaches trying to find ways to provide solutions to the client in front of us. And because the client is so varied, our repository of solutions should be so varied, which means we have to be generalists. You can care for, you could for yourself, you can specialize in one thing and you can like love one thing more than the others, but you should also be able to divorce yourself from that bias and say, okay, that's me. What are the 99 other people that I'm working with? What do they want and how do I help them? Because they're not you. I think that, I think what you just said is so true. If, uh, and, and less than, you know, it's a smaller percentage of coaches that have that purely defined niche for one thing, um, mm. i.e. The, 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 the 16 week body transformation. But especially with the online world now, there is the desire to bring the results and the result is aesthetic. And if there's no way of presenting an aesthetic result, then in their mind, they've got no way of showing a result. Therefore, 
they are stuck because when the client's got the result, they don't stay long term. So as a coach, let's enter into this kind of diverse way of thinking about the human body and how it moves and what value we can therefore bring to a client. If you were to take a coach and say, look, you're thinking of this, you know, one dimensional style training and you're giving them the training program, it doesn't involve all these other things. Put your mindset into a coach that's thinking very one dimensional in terms of, okay, this is your training plan. This is your nutrition. Let's get the results. And now we're thinking longevity, enjoyment, um, variety of training methodologies. How does a coach bring all that together? And what do I need to be thinking about? Um, I would say that you'll be surprised why people are actually coming to you as a coach. We think that they're there for the aesthetic. They're there for the before and after. Like they, they want to drop 10 pounds on my wedding. And a lot of people will tell you that and they'll truly believe that as a client. But what really makes that client stick around? It's not that that, that they just got the result. The result is, of course, that's, that's, that's the admission fee to, to, to jump on the ride. But what they makes them really stick around is the experience that they're having throughout it all. And, you know, there are so many ways to skin the cat of getting somebody lean. Like you've got the most shredded jacked CrossFitters out there who will compete with bodybuilders any any day of the week and they'll beat them you've got gymnasts who do the same you'll have you have sprinters who aren't even specialized in hypertrophy you have you know look at that um what's that robert forsterman dude in the in the olympics with the the cyclist he's got the biggest fucking legs i've ever seen you know he he would beat tom platts if he got them shredded down and you know he he's, he does do strength training of course and hypertrophy work of course but that's not his bread and butter it's like there are so many ways to skin a, to skin a cat somebody's coming to you and they're telling you they want an aesthetic result and there will be deadlines sometimes somebody will say i've got my sister's wedding coming up in two months i need to look shredded for that sure let's do what we can for that but what really makes them stick around and enjoy those two months is the experience you can deliver to them to make sure that's tailored to them and it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be bodybuilding meal plan specific macros it doesn't have to be perfect like that. Because even if you give them a suboptimal plan, a 70% of the plan versus 100% perfection, but it's something they super enjoy, they will get 70% of the results, but they'll stick around so much longer because they love you. They love the training they get addicted to you. And that's what you want as a coach. You don't want to be someone who just churns out a shit ton of transformations, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, see you later, and then you can't retain them. You want to create a system that cultivates that excitement to come see you. The, the client who's calling and saying, hey, my payment's going to bounce this week. Can I please, please, please still come see you? I, sh- I promise you I'll pay double next time to come see you. They can do whatever it takes to make sure they don't lose their spot with you. And the only way you're going to get that is not by saying, hey, I'm going to push you to get this result of the 10 kilos in 10 weeks. You've got to pull them through with the enticement of an exciting experience. And that's something that you can't deliver through the one dimension because that'll work for one person, not everybody else. Okay. I love this, right? Because I've said this, you know, I go in the gym and I still do a lot of my bodybuilding stuff and uh, I do a lot more mobility now and movement mm. and a lot of, I'm, I do a lot of longevity work myself as well because uh, the longevity at 46 now, you know, you know, whether it's my ice baths or whatever I do and all the stuff that actually makes living for me enjoyable and exciting and vari- varied and you know, I look at what I did with bodybuilding and I love it and I never would do anything differently personally myself. But I had a, I had a goal to be big, lean and strong, right? But then mm. now, as I start to go into the gym a little bit, I starting to think at 46 and I look at other people, I think, is giving you a program to sit on the same machines every single day of the week possibly interesting to you and enjoyable enough for you to spend the next year paying me to help you? Is it potentially boring in some dimensions, Right. And I always said to coaches, you know, if you're giving the same program, co- personal training is boring. But even online coaching, when a client receives a program and it's all one dimensional. So let's kind of go through from mobility, movement, variety of some exercises that maybe coaches aren't thinking of. And then if we are also talking about the online space, how do we make this experience where a client could actually learn this stuff? Um, yeah. you, you know, so so I'd let, let's start at the beginning. You know, a lot of coaches, especially online coaches and personal trainers, they're not really adding in a lot of the mobility and movement stuff. They're going straight into the training workout. What's your approach at that kind of mobility and movement stuff that would make it enjoyable for a client and progressive? Yeah. Um, so how to make mobility enjoyable? I mean, that comes down to the programming side of maybe you could squeeze it in as a rest period or something like that. Nobody wants to come in and spend 20 minutes or even 10 minutes doing their mobility warm up. 
you know it's as simple as that but you can be smart about how you choose exercises like maybe you don't start on squats maybe you start on split squats for that person um maybe you start with some calf work before they do their leg day because it helps them mobilize the ankle as well as give them jacked calves maybe you do some bicep curls before before they bench because doing the bicep curl will get them to open up into a shoulder extension of doing like a cable curl for example um which can help them with their chest range of motion so it's about finding that solution that is like the the most similar to what they're currently doing and enjoying and then getting them to take that step further. But then in terms of like, how do you make like the general mobility stuff, like trying to do a forward pike fold, how do you make that sexy? Um, that's a that's a that's a more difficult one to reconcile because it depends on what you're interested in. You know, like me personally, I think it'd be fucking cool to be able to drop into the splits just at at will. And that's why that's one of my goals is to like work on my splits. And that's why yeah. I'm really nerding out and trying to find the best solutions for that on improving my hip range of motion and my mobility. Um, but it can also just be like, I personally just am really drawn to just how things can just look really nice when you're very mobile. Like, and these things are all within our possibilities to get that mobility. And, you know, like, honestly, how attractive is it to do a barbell back squat? We think it's attractive, but it actually isn't to most people. We're conditioned to think it's attractive. So why the hell can't we be conditioned to think that doing a 30-second couch stretch isn't as attractive? It's just conditioning based on... And the reason why we, we are so rewarded by the barbell squat is because we can see the progression. We can see, we can feel something immediate afterwards. You get a good pump after. You can get those exact same things from a couch stretch. There's no reason why you can't add in some kind of progression into that to be able to track where you're currently at and where you are 10 minutes later. It won't be a thick quad pump, but it'll be, I feel better. I move better. Look at this before and after of how I can move within 10 minutes of this stuff. This is exciting. I wonder how far I can take this. I wonder what happens if I come in next week and do this other stretch instead. Um, it's the same process. And then after a while, you get conditioned to it and you start chasing that high of like, I want to see how much more mobile I can get. Um, I want to see what else could be possible by doing this. And then, of course, the other thing, and this is the other layer to it, is make sure that whatever you give people, it's something that they can very easily start to do and implement and that you've reduced as you've removed as much friction and removed as many barriers as possible to helping them succeed at what it is they want to do with the stretch or the mobility stuff. Um, so that's as simple as providing, obviously, the right program with it, make sure it's easy to set up. You don't need to spend half an hour doing it and you can just give them these immediate reward feedback things hey after you've done this couch stretch do five reps of bodyweight squats because what happens those bodyweight squats will feel incredible after the couch stretch and you'd be more inclined to be like hey i can make that link together those two movements being really good for each other i want to do more of this I and it's, it's said, a whole package. what you just said was really interesting because the whole idea of stretching i mean a lot of coaches don't do it mobility coaches don't do it so they don't share it they don't put it on their socials they don't introduce it to their clients but they know their clients need it um but like you just said that ability to be able to give them the understanding of why this actually is going to benefit this and then send, getting them to do it and then go away and actually do the exercise afterwards and noticing an improved benefit that mm. actually comes down to your ability to communicate the need to do it as opposed to telling somebody just to do it yes exactly it's always like you know this is part of why i was successful with touring and teaching was i would always come down to like breaking people down here is why we do this and here are the quick wins and also what one thing i would always show as a as a slight gimmick in a lot of what i teach was i would always try to make sure that people could have a, an immediate feedback before and after kind of thing saying hey we're about to do this exercise for your hip flexors we could just do it and then you know hey it's a cool exercise and here's why you should do it but if i had you do something like a bodyweight squat prior or like a toe touch cold and then do the hip flexor exercise and then do the bodyweight squat or the toe touch after i know it's going to feel better and it's going to look better and i know it's going to give you that immediate buy-in and i know you're going to now remember that forever it's like this is why i should do this even if it's not perfectly correct as to why you should do it it's enough to get them over the line to start to explore it more and that's all you need what you just explained is, is, as an educator, what you're explaining on this on this podcast right now, which is fascinating, I feel that coaches are not very good at communicating. I feel that they're very good at being able to just write a program and send it to somebody's inbox. But then suddenly, if we go on your website or listen to your YouTube your YouTube or listen to you on Instagram, I'm listening. There's a, an a, a immense pa passion, but there's also a linking to everything that we want to do and why we're doing it. And this this comes back to being an educator. And the importance of a coach becoming an educator in this modern world with so much education out there, it's almost like there's a disconnect between the program that's written and then sharing how this can be integrated. 
into everything that you're doing because there's, there's a process to what you're putting together for people. So there's the mobility into the training, there's the correlation and why it's so valuable. And what this has just dawned on me is how potentially a lot of coaches are providing a workout with no context and the client's not understanding it. The client's getting bored. They're seeing just something on a piece of paper and there's there's no real education to it. So have you found that through all your teachings over the years that I mean, everything you do now is on video format. And I'm assuming mm. that everything is broken down into different phases. And this means that if coaches want to get a bit of a better buy-in, coaches need to be better educators. Absolutely. It's, um, I think people have, like the biggest mistake a lot of coaches ha- make is they focus on knowledge instead of experience. And when I say experience, I don't mean just like, oh, you've got a wealth of experience from trying this stuff out. I mean, experience being the service that you deliver to the people the experience they have. Mm. That's what you should focus on, not on the knowledge. You don't need another 10 letters after your after your name. You don't need more um, more knowledge accumulation. You don't even need all your own personal experience accumulation. What you need to focus on is the experience you deliver to the client. How can you elevate their experience more and make it just a better service? And what you'll find is the common trend of people not sticking with things. So they don't understand why it's important. They haven't really made the connection. And why didn't they make the connection? Because you didn't tell them. Because that was your job as the coach, not to be this curator of knowledge but to and who just tells them what to do. But your role as the coach is to communicate, as you say, effectively with them to get them to understand it, teach them how to fish. But people think, I've got to have, I've got to be a doctor, I've got to have a PhD, I've got to have all, and I'll tell them, you know what? I've got fucking nothing. I have nothing and I guarantee that I impact You know, not arrogantly, I impact a shit ton of people every single day without even trying. It's not because of my accolades as an as an educated person who's got this degree. It's not. It's because I've understood from having to, because I I screwed up a lot myself as a coach. I've had to understand the importance of the client experience and what is missing from that. What's not getting their buy-in? It's as you say, communication. Make sure it comes back to them. Instead of thinking it's about you having to be smarter or bigger or better looking, no, make it about them because they're the one they care about themselves. They don't care about you. They care about themselves. What, what, what's, what runs through your mind when I say that, you know, we talk about this customer experience, you know, for you to retain a customer long term as a coach, what's constantly going through your mind with the customer experience? What, what, you know, whether it's from the first program or achieving a first step of result, how, how are you constantly thinking? That's that one step ahead. What do you what do you think a client needs to continue to move them along uh, beyond obviously just the education? Um, it's, it's very simple. It's, it's are they happy? You know, <laughs> it's are they actually enjoying what they're doing? It's as simple as that. Like, are, are they in? Are they getting fulfillment out of that? That's what's going to make them stick around. Or are they so addicted to it in some way um, where? It's no longer a point of motivation or discipline. It's a point of where they don't show up, they feel weird. You know, like I say, yeah, um, yeah. I was talking about this with, um, with Hormozy last year. Um, it was how he's talking a lot about like, he doesn't think motivation or discipline is a thing. You think it's, it's about addiction. And I was like, that's actually quite, quite true because like I am not disciplined to eat protein in every meal. I'm addicted because if I don't have protein in one of my meals, if I don't hit the minimum leucine threshold of 20 grams of protein or whatever it is, I actually feel weird, like I've mm-hmm. done something wrong, even though I've done nothing wrong. You know, Just from my conditioning of so much time doing it, I've, I just feel Ugh. like that's, that's not right. I can't have a meal without protein in it. Um, so I'm not motivated to, do, to have protein. I'm not disciplined to have protein. I'm literally addicted to that process. And, you know, are there ways you can achieve that with a client? Probably through enough repetition, yes. But what I say, I'll tell people like it's, a lot simpler than you think. If as long as people are happy with the service that they're getting, which means which means different things things for different people. Some people want a lot of check-ins. Some people want a lot of handhold. Other people just want to be just hands off and they just want a very easy to follow, seamless experience um, without any of the bells and whistles. Everybody's very very different with that. So as long as you know who the person is you're dealing with and what what makes them tick, and you can give it to them to make them happy and content, then there shouldn't just be a one size fits all approach. Um, it should just be like work with that person and make sure that they're happy with it. And it's just feedback, it's communication and just also being in- intuitive with the th- cues that they may not tell you mm-hmm. because they're not going to tell you that they're unhappy all the time, but you'll be able to sense it. You should I anyway. What, I think what you've just said is, is so powerful. This whole thing about addiction, 
I'm addicted to training. I'm addicted to work. I'm addicted to my health. I'm addicted to relationships. I don't have any problem with any of these these words. It's just, you know, I, there's an obsession there for me with all of these things. They're non-negotiables. They happen every single day. And then we've got this, this, this disconnect with a client that comes to see us who's obsessed with poor quality food, obsessed with, you know, late nights. And, and I always put it as a responsibility. You've come to me to try and help you to switch those obsessions into things that serve your life rather than complicate your life. And, you know, as you were saying, if you're thinking about your client, if they're enjoying it, if you're being varied with your programming, if you're not giving them a one size fits all approach and you're constant and they're enjoying the process, they have no reason to leave. Exactly. You know, that they, they have no reason to leave. Now, now when it comes to exercising, I know I, you know, I, you know, on, on your Instagram, you talk about things that work, things that don't work. You've got your own opinions when it comes to straight strength training. Mm. What do we do? What do we spend too much time doing that's unnecessary when it comes to strength training? It's like training in the gym, like what, yeah, what we training spend? in the gym. We're talking. Like, you got all the gym behind you. Like yeah. every coach that I ever speak to is kind of like you know people do this, but it's an in, it, it, it's not the right thing to be doing. What are your big kind of you know in, in your belief of, of training that that um, coaches are delivering, but they they don't have as effectiveness. Um, oh, that's a really good question. Um, like it's, it's not like one, it's not like one exercise or style of training or anything like that. Like it's not like, oh, stretching is a waste of time or this is a waste of time. I think it's more the mindset that they take to their training, um, which I kind of touched on before is I think people are, um, um, a lot of people, so it's not everybody, but a lot of people are too focused on making things too perfect and, and again, optimal. Okay, whatever that yeah. whatever that means for the person and it's like well optimal is always going to come down to the individual in front of you and it can be suboptimal by the science it can be suboptimal for the athlete in the athlete situation but if it's optimal for the person even the athletes as a person then fuck yeah let them do it and be ready to break those rules as much as possible um and because like i said you can get a result doing just about anything and you'll see the most absurd training methodologies that work in elite sports and it's like yeah maybe it worked in spite of it like people say look at how ronnie coleman trained it was so suboptimal and that's why he's all fucked up and broken now and he, and he would have gotten even bigger had he have had the, the the most optimal biomechanically constrained and externally supported exercise like yeah he might have but he might have turned out the exact same as well and he might have not have enjoyed that or gotten as much out of this fancy biomechanical stuff anyway that he actually may not have had a good result you don't know you're not a soothsayer you can't tell the future you can't predict what's going to happen to somebody all you can do is do your best to relate to the person in front of you or the people if it's like a group coaching kind of setting relate to the, that group of people that you work with and say what's going to work best for them based on what they're giving giving you and it may not fall into the most perfect biomechanical or optimal scientifically based training but the whole science-based thing doesn't mean following the papers to a t science is all about experimentation having a hypothesis testing it out seeing what works and changing your your actions thereafter when you see the results that's a science-based trainer it's not about quoting pubmed and saying here's my citations it's about saying i'm just gonna screw around this and see what works best for the person or people we've seen well we've seen a lot of coaches you know over the, probably over the last five years you know exercise biomechanics has come in and movement doing exercises through a, a larger range of movement has become mm. less of a thing and more of a lock-in everything's got to be perfectly biomechanically yeah. nothing's got to move nothing's got to move nothing's got to move when you're doing anything here nothing's got to move um that whole idea of nothing really should but you you see a lot of trainers in the gym nothing's moving the hip doesn't move yeah. that the, the, this doesn't move that doesn't move like are we are we wrong in that regard now where where biomechanics came in and nothing was able to move and everybody in the gym looked like a robot when they were training and somebody's doing a bicep curl and then they would get they, they, they would get to here and then have a little bit of shoulder flexion and their whole instagram feed would go you're doing it wrong you're doing it wrong like how has that how has that movement kind of changed? And what are your views around the high end of locking everything in movement that was around for the last five years? It's it's I definitely um yeah, it's 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 extreme and it's it's unwarranted, I think. It's like, what do you think will really happen if you let a little bit of form degradation happen or a little bit of extraneous accessory muscles kicking in or whatever? Well, let's say I'm doing a bicep curl and I do a little bit of anterior glide or do a little bit of momentum shifting. It's like, is that going to kill me? Is that going to 
cause my biceps to deactivate? Is that going to cause my lower back to just explode? I mean, this whole idea of movement optimism is about the fact that the body is resilient and it can be built up and it can withstand anything. But the way that we do that is we have to expose it to that. And the thing is, if you never expose your body to anything, but the perfectly biomechanically stable, smooth technique, slow eccentric, controlled squeezing concentric with volitional force behind it. It's like, so what happens for the other 23 hours of the day when life is random and throwing curveballs your way and you have to move into anterior glide and you have to lift something, lift an object off the ground with without being perfectly biomechanically correct all the time? If you're not prepared for that, you're vulnerable, you're weak. And if all you know is just this one thing in the gym of this perfect technique all the time, that's actually going to be to your detriment because you're not training 24-7. You're training a couple of hours and you can try to optimize that. But part of optimizing that should be preparing your body for everything that you handle in life. Because the thing, the common denominator behind the most successful athletes of bodybuilders, powerlifters, gymnasts, sprinters, is that they stay injury-free. So they can train for longer. They can have a longer career. And what's going to help them from doing that is being more physically prepared. And physical and general physical preparedness isn't about locking things down. It's about exposing your body to as much variation as possible in and out of the gym. But if you never do it in the gym because all you obsess over is keeping things perfect, you're screwing yourself up just as much as if you were going into a complete Ronnie Coleman mode and just yeeting the weights all over the place. There's a middle ground that should exist, but we've swung too far. What uh, what exercises? Now this this carries over to a lot of the gem pop, you know, mm. bodybuilders. And I'd love your take on this because it's going to be a selfishly question for me, but I know it's going to serve a lot of people. Mm. I'm 46. I've been bodybuilding all my, you know, since I was well training, lifting, trying to grow my physique since 16. In the realm of functionality and movement and torso rotation or extension of the the, the, the body, whatever, whatever it may be, somebody that's coming that's in bodybuilding right now. That, that's all coming towards the end of bodybuilding or physique development on a day-to-day basis from a functionality perspective in terms of movement, what would somebody like I be adding in over the next three to five years that you would say to me, do you know what? Okay, you're doing your split squats, your squats, your RDLs and everything like that. But from a torso rotation or a mobility perspective or some degree of alternative exercises that would increase your functionality of your body, what would you be adding in? And that would add value to a coach that's maybe doing in a similar position or working with more general population clients that aren't really getting any degree of functionality apart from the, the standard, you know, hack squat, leg press and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, I would make it a goal to get very good at sprinting. Really? doesn't mean that you start sprinting today because you'll probably blow a hamstring. Um, mm-hmm. Like I would too. Um, but that would be maybe the six-month goal, the 12-month goal, being able to be conditioned enough to be able to do several bursts of 100-meter sprints with a good three, four-minute rest between each one or even longer, like really pushing yourself and sending it for these sprints because – it looks so simple. And like, I know, you know, Gunhead, you'd be able to sprint right now and do pretty well at it. But there's a lot of nuance that goes into sprinting in a straight line. There's a lot of rotational forces that have to occur at the thoracic, at the, at the, at the lumbar, at the pelvis, down at the, um, the femurs. There's so much going on um, to do it at a high intensity, at a high velocity. Um, like, honestly, I would say I'm not prepared to be doing that right now for myself. If I was to, if I was to warm up a little bit now and go for a sprint, I know that it's not where it needs to be. And I still need to do a lot more drilling to make it where I'd like it to be. doesn't mean that I won't. I'm still going to, you know, learn, like work on that skill. Um, but the process of saying you want to get better at sprinting, that unlocks a lot of doors for you of saying, okay, I need to make sure I know how to run effectively first can i actually sustain like a 5k run can i can i sustain a 10k run can i without breaking down and falling into just biomechanically inefficient running and breathing patterns if i can do that with some endurance then maybe i can start tapering it down and working on some more specific gait cycle running sprinting drills and apply that to a track and by the time you're sprinting at a you know at a relatively high level there um on some regular basis, you're getting all the rotational forces you need. You're getting all the power output, the explosiveness. um, You're getting all of that. That's what I'd be focusing on. That's what I'm focusing on myself, honestly. It's really interesting you say that because through all, I used to play rugby and and through all my, um, you know, now if I, if even if I jog to do something or even if it's a minute to go somewhere, I've got to do something a bit quickly. Like I, my biomechanical structure just almost doesn't know how to run. Yeah, totally. 
And it's so it's so crazy. So therefore, when you start to think about it, extension of the hip, internal external rotation of the hip, the 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 the, the torso rotation, everything starts to come in and everything starts to to move a lot more. It's a great bit of advice that I will. Um, yeah, if I say after this, and I say to my wife, I'm going to try and run around the block, and she's like, "What? Are you crazy?" Um, uh, that 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 that's fascinating. I love that. Now, I mean, delving into. Um, uh, you know, you put out a lot of content, mm-hmm. you know, and it's really heavily engaged. And we have a lot of coaches that are like, you know, oh, I struggle with content creation, et cetera, et cetera. Talk us through your kind of framework of how you come up with ideas for content and your key for success in terms of the engagement that you get. Yeah. Um, the ideas is, is very simple. It's just literally whatever's on my mind, whatever I'm doing my training, what questions I'm getting a lot of, or even not a lot of. If I just get a question, I'm like, oh, that's a cool question. I want to answer that. I'll make a piece of content around. Um, there should never be an endless su- supply of ideas. Um, some of them are obviously better than worse, but you should never have an endless supply of ideas coming your way, even if you don't have a huge following, because you, you should be a genuinely curious person. Um, I think most people, I think everybody is generally curious about something. <laughs> maybe it's not training. If it's not training, you know what? Maybe you're in the wrong industry. But whatever it is you're curious about or people around you are curious about, that should be the, the fodder for what your ideas should be. You know, someone's asking me, hey, what's the difference between an RDL and a stiff leg? What happens if I do a 45 degree hyper versus a GHD on a horizontal back extension? What's the difference? Like, oh, that's a great idea for a concept. Let's make that a piece of content. But then, as you say, like, how do you then make it an engaging piece of content. How do you make it compelling? That's that's the hard part, and and I struggle with that myself. You know, cause I'm I think about it a ton, um, but it definitely can be manufactured. It absolutely can be manufactured. Um, you're playing with two things here. One thing you're playing with is what works with algorithms, um, and the other thing you're playing with is human psychology, and they are obviously intricately linked. People think the algorithms are all about rewarding, like a certain look or a certain like aesthetic of you're going to have a certain quality of of um of camera or you have to post a certain time of day or post every single day for engagement i haven't posted in like two fucking weeks you know but i know when i do post again if i do it right in terms of like the content is is valuable for people it will do abs- absolutely fantastically mm-hmm. um the only reason i haven't posted is i've been correct by doing other stuff i'm busy um but you're dealing with the algorithm which is a lot simpler than people think it is in dealing with psychology. The algorithm, it's only designed to make you watch shit for longer. Whatever you watch, whatever you enjoy, it'll keep serving up more and more of that. So even if you never post ever and you've got, you got one follower in your account of YouTube or Instagram or whatever it is, if you post a piece of content that's a fucking banger and it truly is a fucking banger, it will be seen by millions. It really does come down to that because Instagram or YouTube or TikTok, they will recognize that this piece of content Based on the people who see it, they love it, which means more people will love it, which means if they all love it, even more people, it'll just grow on its own. Mm-hmm. It's happening even more so in the last year or so. The algorithms pushed more towards um, the retention. If you can keep somebody watching a video from start to finish, it's going to do well. It's going to go viral. Simple as that. Now, how do you actually make somebody watch a video from start to finish? That's where the human psychology component comes into it in terms of how do you make a story around what you do? How do you create a relationship with the audience or a culture about like a brand about what you create with your content? Um, How do you make sure something so simple as that it's attention grabbing, not because a big yellow caption flashes up, but because there is something interesting about those first scenes that hooks me in. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not the caption, it's the story or it's the question that's probably the thing. Oh, it's a little, it's, it's the clickbait. It's the thing that makes me think to myself, I cannot scroll past this i have to watch and see what happens next um you know like me asking the question of what's the difference between a 45 degree hyper extension and a horizontal back extension honestly it's a pretty fucking boring question like it appeals to you and me because we're trainers like oh i'd love to hear that but it's honestly it's is it really that interesting that i'm going to scroll past it i'm probably going to scroll past you know but is there a way to create something around that that makes it even more interesting or even better so use, that, exa- make- use that example how would you use that example the difference because you see a lot of coaches why do you need to do it here when we can use this because this this i really want to tap into your brain how to do the <laughs> leg extension how to do the line leg curl the difference between an rdl uh, and, a, and a stiff leg like yes they're boring and every coach is doing them 
and they don't get any engagement. How does Eugene make something like that more of an engaging yeah. subject? So um, it's like stiff, stiff leg deadlift versus rain deadlift. I can show you a tutorial. And I've done tutorials on that. And it, and it does, you know, mildly okay. But I can ask you, do you know why it's called a Romanian deadlift? Mm. Do you? And people are like, oh, yeah. I, I, just, I, I use that word all the time. I use an idea all the time. Why is it called that? Tell me more. <laughs> and then and you can start talking about, oh, it's because of this this guy who, um, it's his name, Niku Vlad, who brought it over from from the from Russia. He, oh, sorry, from Romania, not Russia. <laughs> it makes no sense. The Russian from Romania, he brought it over to um to the US. But actually, it actually wasn't him. He was only popularized, but who actually invented it is probably this guy called Istvan Havarek, um, who is a Hungarian coach of the weight of the weightlifting team at the time, and um, he taught it very differently. He taught it with a shrug at the top. You meant to do. A remaining deadlift, straight legged deadlift, you would do it off a deficit as well. You would actually touch the ground and at the top, you would shrug. And somewhere along the line, because that would apply more to like Olympic weightlifting, like a high pull kind of movement with a straight leg um, and longer range of motion. But somewhere along the line, we turned a remaining deadlift into a very short range of motion, hips going back, target your glutes and your hamstrings and stop just below the knee or stop where your hip ranges. It's actually very different to a remaining deadlift. Now, that's not the exact content of our career, but those are the, those are the, the, the little things you could throw into it to make it an interesting story of like, ah, oh, I'm entertained. <laughs> I'm enjoying this and I'm learning something here. Doesn't mean that the current modern Romanian deadlift is wrong or bad, but it's just an interesting piece of information that I want to share at the next dinner party. <laughs> and this is what, what I want to tell people about now. This is what I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this video in a week's time to tell my friend, see, you are fucking wrong saying this is how I should yeah, do the deadlift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and, yeah. um, there's there's these things to be these kind of comparisons we can make about just about any exercise like let's take that 45 degree versus the the flat height uh, the flat back extension um both good exercises both the same motion but how do you make a difference how do you make it exciting for people as content you can say oh it's like kind of boring level one is just saying what's well, the difference and as i said already it's kind of boring yeah. but what if spun it in a way of saying why is this better why is one of them better and we, like, we know one there's not necessarily better worse about the context, but you can very easily front load saying here are the benefits of doing this 45 degree because you get a more a deeper stretch, you get more active range of motion, but then you also get a better pump on this. And you can start to create more of an interesting hook and light and, and story around the exercises and not make it just a boring static tutorial, which no one searches for anyway. What you just said is, you know, a lot of people are not very good at copywriting. Therefore, they don't understand human yeah. psychology. They don't understand yeah. human psychology. At the end of the day, what you just said as a hook is pulling somebody in. So somebody thinks what, what to just kind of, uh, you know, chop up what you've just said. People think, let me put a post out and they put a post out. What we're doing is we're putting a valuable piece of content with a hook that's going to capture someone's attention, that's going to pull in and go, oh, that was valuable. I want to watch something else of yours. So it means you've got to put a little bit of more thought into exactly what it is that you're trying to capture people's attention with. Absolutely. It, it's it's copywriting and same same skill as like copywriting's got a really bad name. So does sales. Like yeah, copywriting absolutely. and sales, they're, they're like four letter words these days. Like, I don't want to be a seller. It's like, well, these are really important skills because it teaches you how to deal with humans. And you should pick up these skills, not because you want to sell a, sell a ton of people into a product they don't need, but because you want to be a better communicator. And everything we do is sales and copywriting. Um, if you're working with people in general, which all of us are, even if you're not in the business, but if you're just in a relationship, you know, you are selling the person into wanting to be in a relationship with you. You are keeping them engaged so they don't cheat on you. You are keeping them around because they're not going to stay with you just out of the goodness of their own heart. They're staying with you because like it or not, they are getting value from the relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how are you providing that? How are you providing that? And there are many ways you can provide that, of course. It's not saying it's a monetary thing or anything like that, but it's this, but this is, it's all the same skill set. It's just how you direct it. Um, and I think people, coaches, especially because the coaches are so good at nerding out on training or nutrition. And I think that's what's going to give them more more love from the audience. I said, no, it's not. What's going to give you more reach with your audience is getting really good at communicating, at sales and at copy um, or finding someone who does who can teach it to you or just like, you know, make them do it for you instead. Um, that's that's what it comes down to for sure. With, with your content, you know, everyone's always trying to come up with brand new, brand new, brand new. Um, are you constantly reviewing your content and redoing some of the ones that have been done before, but just kind of repeating some of these ones sometimes, you know, because if you're coming up with, you know, 
a p- brand new piece of content every single week? Are you using a lot of the data and the insights of what you've got previously and kind of tweaking on that? Because most of the time our message is not that varied. So therefore we're just redesigning ideas that we've done previously to give coaches an idea. of. I think they get paralysis because they think, oh, I did that three months ago. I can't do a variation of that again. Mm. No, totally. I, 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 I always, I don't like repost directly, but I'll, um, I'll definitely remake similar content. Like one of my most popular pieces that I've done probably about a dozen times in different formats is um, different femur lengths, torso lengths, and how that impacts your squat. You know, like I, I've, I've done that so many times over the past 10 years. And every time I do it, it's a little bit better. I change how I communicate. I change how I film it. I change what models I use. Um, like when I first started doing it, it was just pulling a clip from a workshop that I taught about that. And now it's manufactured content around that specific topic where I have myself and my partner, Katrina, we've got similar heights, but we have very different proportions. So I'll use us as demonstrative models and I'll make sure that it's filmed properly. I'll make sure that it's paced well in terms of the content, keep people engaged through it all. That's very easy to understand and digest. Um, And that piece of content now will get, you know, it'll get maybe 10 million views. Whereas 10 years ago, when I first posted it, it was getting maybe a thousand views because the content wasn't as engaging. There's no reason why you can't redo something that did really well. Um, and just try to make it better. Even like less viral content. I always look back at my content content and say, how can I make it better? How can I make it more interesting? I liked that message and it did really well. How can I say it again, but differently? How can I reach more people with that same message and impact them in a, in a better way? Um, even the same people, you know, what if they saw the exact same message, but a slightly different angle that gave them a better understanding of it? Um, mm. They liked it once, they liked it. Now, obviously, you just mentioned 10 million views. You're over 500,000 you know, Instagram followers. Like This brings with it attention, and with attention, it brings sales, and with sales, it brings money. And yep. uh, there's a there's a subject that I you know I don't, don't want anybody to ever shy away from is that when you have a gift to bring to the world and you're helping a lot of people, you deserve to get paid well for it. Mm-hmm. How has your relationship with money changed over the last ten years developing the business um, to to this day? And and you know how has your relationship with money changed? And what does money mean to you? Yeah. So growing up, um, like we weren't very well off. Um, we weren't poor at all as a family, but my parents had to work super, super hard to be able to provide for us. Um, and it was always in my head that like we could afford what we wanted to afford and have luxuries, but it was always still to me of just save your money, save, save, save your money. And um, when I started working and making money, I wanted to work as soon as I could. When I was like 14, I started working part-time jobs and whatnot. Um, I'd always just save as much money as I possibly could. And even, you know, um, I remember... Um, John Meadows, he would always tell me when you could see I was successful, he was like, are you saving your money? Make sure you're saving. So it was always in my head of like, save your money, save your money, save your money. Well, he, he, was and, a, he was a money man, wasn't he? He came from banking. Yeah. And he was he was always asking me like, now, now Eugene, are you saving your money? You're not spending on like cars? And I was like, I don't, I've got the same car I've had for the last five years and it's falling apart. And I still, I don't want to buy another car. Um, it's always in my head, save your money, be frugal. Um, and then it was a few years ago, you know, but doing this, I had a lot of money saved up because I don't spend a lot of money on things, you know, apart from maybe a gym or whatever. Um, but, but then I realized, what is this savings really doing for me? Um, yes, it's security. And I always tell people, always have security. Always have, you know, whatever it is for you to get the security for you. For me, it means, you know, enough where if I didn't work for a year, I would be okay. You know, like I, I would be able to afford my living expenses and not die. Because if God forbid, you know, t- touch wood, if anything was happened to me, I'd know that, okay, I'm able to provide for myself, um, worse comes to worse. And I, I've got enough of a buffer to be able to do that. So that's what I always tell people, try to have that. But there came a point where I just realized, what is all this saving really doing for me? It's not enabling me to do anything else. And what opportunities can spending that money provide for me? And the reality was, as much as I was saving, I never understood why I was doing it apart from that basic security thing. And I never really cared. Like I, I couldn't tell you how much money I was making. I don't know what was coming in. Like when I was on tour, when I met you, money was coming in quick. You know, like you can do the math on that. I had like 20 to 40 people paying about a grand a head for a weekend event. And I was doing about 50 of them a year. And I had very little expenses. There was a lot of money coming in. I remember I got back from my first year doing that. My accountant was like, Eugene, what the fuck happened? <laughs> like, you got to tell me when you do this kind of stuff because now you got to pay a lot of tax. And I was like, oh, okay, shit. <laughs> and um so i paid a lot of tax <laughs> but more important i just realized like i never really 
I even now I can't tell you how much money I make. I can't tell you how much money comes in each day or how much comes in each week. I know that I can afford my expenses and I can afford my bills. And I, but I also, um, what I really care more about is can I afford the expenses that I need to do to further my business goals to be able to get a better impact? Like this past year, I've spent around two and a half million dollars on app development on making sure that Ganbaru, we're launching on, we're relaunching on Monday, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, but there is going to be nothing like that. This is going to deliver an ex- exceptional service that my people have been, haven't even known that they've wanted. They haven't known that they've wanted it. <laughs> like they're, they're happy as is, you know, we have thousands upon thousands of very happy customers who are raving about us, but it's still just like, you know what? I know from what they're not telling me, what would make it even better and what that would mean impact wise on the industry and on other coaches that I want to work with. Okay. How can I do this? What has to happen? Oh, I've got to spend two and a half million dollars. I will do it. And as long as I can afford to do that, I'm happy. Although it does mean, um, like I just, re- I was telling Katrina before, I just received a $400,000 bill um, for the past month and I've got to pay that. And that's going to zero out one of my accounts or like my main business account. It's done. It's like, cool. So <laughs> I hope that the launch does enough to be able to let me keep things afloat after that. Um, but I very much more see money now. It's not something you need to accrue, but it's something you need to have enough of to be able to know you do the next thing. Mm-hmm. have your security always have your security um but see it as something that you don't want to just retain for the sake of retaining it it should be the tool that you use to further your business and it could be something as simple as saying hey you made an extra hundred bucks a week now you're on you know you sign a new client how can you spend that hundred bucks immediately to leverage your business to be better the best decisions i made was hiring a bookkeeper was hiring a accountant was hiring all these other people who i was not good at doing these certain things so it was paying for different services that would help to leverage my time better you know how can i do these things um because if you're existing on say a grand a week right now and you're happy you make an extra hundred bucks you shouldn't think well who hundred bucks in my back pocket you should think hundred bucks i want to spend as quickly as i can to make more money yeah. if that's your goal or to have a better impact yeah, no, I love this. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, the whole idea about the money that we bring in is that we can use it to do the things that we want to do the most. And if it's if it's make a big impact with a website, invest in people to help you to get further ahead, you know, until you are at least where you want to be, it's, it's got to be going back into the business. That's the the, the message here, right? Always, always. Like love I that. didn't really understand that when people, like I would hear about other businesses saying, oh, I don't pay myself because I'm always best back, investing back in the business. I was like, why? What do you have to invest in? Just take some money save it whatever buy a house and it was oh now i'm like i see i see the, i see the, the the answer like the reason why they would say that because there is always something more you can invest in um as long as you live simply yourself as well um, and there's there's two sides to that but there should always be something that you can invest in to make things better it doesn't mean you have to drop all your money immediately and zero your bank accounts but there should always be this idea of saying yes i want to um just invest to grow if that's your goal of course the the uh the, the there's a lot of what a lot of coaches see in the industry, you know, as soon as they make a little bit of money, they, it all goes on materialism, right? And yeah. look, I think materialism, personally, I think, okay, there's this saying that materialism is the watches, the cars, and all this sort of cars and all this sort of stuff. But from your perspective, you know, what I can hear from you is that the things that you invest in is what's going to help you to get to where you want to be. Um, but the things that you don't invest in is the things that aren't actually going to help you get to where they, are, where they want to be. Coaches that generally get uh, their first batch of, relatively decent income spend it all what's your advice to coaches that just push that push that money away and just spend it on stuff that's not even going to help them grow well i mean if it makes them happy makes them happy you know um and some people yeah they just want to have the balenciaga shoes they want to have the rolex on their wrist and they're happy with that so cool okay um are you going to be able to do that in 10 years time (laughs) are you going to pawn that watch to be able to afford rent um i mean there is some force at that unfortunately a lot of people don't have that force under thinking like this is not going to last Mm -hmm. this is not going to last even you know like ganbaru is an app it's doing exceptionally well one of the one of the big reasons behind why i've done such a big push the last year for redevelopments and changing up so much spending so much money is because i know that as it was 12 months ago, it is not going to last. Even though, you know, 12 months ago, it's it's pulling in millions of dollars a year in in in, in profit, not revenue. It's like, it's fucking gold. Mm-hmm. But it's also saying, that's not going to last. Is that going to be there in 10 years' time as it is now? Is it going to be there when I'm bringing up my daughter? Is it going to still be there? It definitely is not. So what do I have to do to make sure that it is still there in 10, 20 years' time? How do I create that legacy product? How do I create that? 
that thing. And the way they create that thing is about um, thinking about impact on people and others. Um, but it all comes down from the four starters of being able to confidently say, this won't be here tomorrow. And I think a lot of the people, not coaches, the people who have that mentality of um, just spend money when it comes in, is they're not thinking that, well, maybe they are thinking about they won't be here tomorrow, so they better enjoy it now. <laughs> Different personalities, right? Yeah, they think yeah, I won't yeah. be here tomorrow, I'll waste it all now so I can enjoy it and just forget about it later. Whereas I'm more averse to it and say, you know what, it's not going to be here tomorrow. I better get ahead to make sure that something is going to be there tomorrow. That's incredibly valuable, really is. Um, final question I have for you, and I, I like to ask this question to everybody that I interview. This is the Mastery Podcast. What does the word mastery mean to Eugene? Um, oh, okay. Think on that one. The word mastery, it means to me like you've you've reached a point where you shouldn't need to continue to prove yourself in my eyes. I think like when I think of someone who's mastered something, they're not trying to be showy. They're not trying to be impressive because what they do speaks for itself. And when you've reached a certain point of mastery in something as well, that's where you start, as I said, the very start of the conversation is where you start knowing how to break all the rules that made you a master in the first place. You know, like for like for like Bruce Lee to become a master at martial arts, he had to practice the one kick 10,000 times. Um, in doing so, it enabled him to learn how to break all the rules of traditional martial arts practice and pretty much birth this idea of mixed martial arts with his Jeet Kune Do, which is like fighting without fighting. And it's not really having one rigid structure to martial arts uh, where it was so based on rules. I think mastery is that. Love that. I love that. Eugene, I've really, really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, I know so many coaches worldwide are going to get so much value from this, but by way of introduction to your platform and how people can find out about you if they are unaware at this moment in time, how do we find out about you and learn from you? Uh, most of them, like, so find me on Instagram. That's where I'm the most active. Um, although I said I haven't been active in the last, last few weeks, but that's where I am the most active. And for people, if you enjoy what you enjoy there, you'll just find everything else. Don't need to worry about websites or other channels, just Instagram or YouTube, search my name and start there. Love that. Well, listen, um, it's uh, it's gone uh, nearly 90 minutes and that, that's because it's such an engaging and enjoyable conversation. And uh, I know you and I have spoke for a while now about getting this together. So uh, I'm very, very grateful for your time. Uh, I know you're a new father. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't say that at the beginning of the call, but I just wanted to say congratulations because mine's just around the corner. So uh, we have that we have that in common. But I just wanted to say congratulations to you and uh, I hope your new daughter is doing well. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a really exciting couple of what are we now? We're in November, so about three months almost. Wow, wow. wow. Um, yeah, it, it goes by very quickly, and I'm, I'm very excited for you too to 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 watch you like go through what I've been going through the last. I'm at, that, weeks. I'm at that stage that you didn't know three months ago. I'm I'm just on the edge of kind of nearly yeah. knowing. So uh, yeah, yeah, looking forward to it. But congratulations to you, and uh, honestly, Eugene, thank you for your time, and uh, I shall speak to you very soon. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.